Welcome to chapter one of How to Read Water by Tristan Gooley. Today we'll be discussing quite a few fun facts about water and getting right into how to read it, how to start to understand it in new ways. Gooley's always a wealth of information. In the beginning, the introduction of the book, he was leaving on a sailing expedition from Norway to England. And so this is the National Bibliothèque of Norway. And because I couldn't find out where Tristan Gooley's from on his website or anywhere else, it just says all about his expeditions and continents that he's been on and all this other stuff. So I figured why not go with the Library of Norway, seeing he was in Norway and sailing from Norway at the beginning of the book. And it's fun to pick a library and it's fitting. I found this nice picture with water out front in front of the library and we are talking about water, right? So we're going to get right into it. Chapter one is called the launching. Very fitting. Now there's a couple of things we're going to need to know before we launch out. And that's a meniscus. Uh, a meniscus is a crescent or a crescent shaped thing. It's a lens convex on one side and a concave on the other. In physics, it's the curved upper surface of a column of liquid as a result of capillarity. It is convex when the walls of the container are dry, concave when they are wet. Okay, so Gooley starts off by saying water is rarely flat. You will notice how the surface of the water in the glass is not flat. It curves up slightly at the edges. It is being pulled by the glass and then sticking to the edges. The attraction between the water and the glass turns what would otherwise be a flat surface into the gentlest of bowls with a tiny rim. What is the use of noticing that, he says? A stepping stone to helping us understand why a river will flood. The water is attracted to glass. Most liquids will show either an attraction or a repulsion for other substances. Liquids are also weakly attracted to themselves. If they were not, they would separate and become gaseous. Water is attracted to water. So as you see in the background of this, uh, of me, you see the water seems to be kind of lying flat except for the fountain. And the water appears to be doing that because it's attracted to the water below it. Now, capillarity is the state of being capillary, of or like a hair. And as you'll see, uh, water is attracted to like the fine hairs on a paintbrush or some other brush. It's attracted to glass. It's attracted to the... Uh, type of fabric they use for paper towels. So a force that is the result of adhesion, cohesion, and surface tension. So this is capillary action now. A force that is the result of adhesion, cohesion, and surface tension in liquids which are in contact with solids as in, capilla as in a capillary tube. When the cohesive forces greater, the surface tends to be depressed. So cohesive force, meaning the elements staying together, right? We have to now distinguish before we move on between cohesion and adhesion. So cohesion is the actor tendency of cohering, the tendency to stick together. So water behind me is sticking together. The water on the surface is being attracted to the stuff on the bottom so that it's causing it to stick. There's a stickiness to water, Leonardo da Vinci observed, or so they say. An adhesion, the act of sticking to something or the state of being stuck together. Um, so if you have water, it's attracted to water, it's cohesive. And then all of a sudden, if you add in these paintbrush fibers onto the surface, it will all of a sudden start climbing the paintbrush as you'll see in one of the experiments we get into in a couple of minutes. And the water will start climbing the paintbrush fibers because of this capillary action, which means that the adhesive force 
and the attraction of water to itself upon that force, uh, upon that fiber rather, is now becoming stronger because more water is going up the brush. So water is not only attracted to the paintbrush fibers, but then it's also attracted to itself. So it's like a double attraction. So that's why I said an adhesion, it is the result of adhesion, cohesion, and surface tension. So it's adhering to the paintbrush fibers. It's cohering to itself. And it's the surface tension is the dividing line between it wanting to go down towards more water and up towards the paintbrush fibers and up towards itself or up towards the, the curved sides of the glass if we put it in a glass bowl, right? So water is attracted to water. And capillary action climbs up. This is how trees derive their, their sustenance. So Leonardo da Vinci is said to have watched water carefully and its stickiness. He would look at the underside of tree branches. And when a drop is big enough to fall, it does so with some resistance. In 1508, he noted the way that before a drop finally falls, it stretches until a neck of water is formed. When that is too thin to support the weight of the drop, then it does finally fall. So you can watch this effect for yourself. You take a look at the leaf tips of a broad leaved tree or shrub. The water collects before enough water gathers and it's battling gravity. Gravity prevails and the drop falls when enough water has gathered. So the leaf often bounces up elegantly at this point and then the process begins again. Water molecules, two hydrogen atoms, one oxygen atom bound together tightly. Teachers don't tell us hydrogen atoms in one water molecule are also attracted to the oxygen atoms and the other water molecules nearby. This makes water stick to water, according to Tristan Gooley. Instead of flattening entirely and running off the table, as you see, there is now a group of small upside down puddles. According to Gooley, gravity is trying to pull the water down. It flattens and then runs so that it flattens and then runs onto the floor. Water's tension is strong enough to resist this. Water still on the table pulls the water back and stops it all from running onto the floor as you see in the big puddle in front of you and the tiny puddles on the side. When you put your finger in one and draw it toward the other one and let go, not much happens. The pool may stretch a little bit in size, but that's all. It has a tendency to shrink back. The water that I pull with my finger gets yanked by the attraction of the water it has left behind, trying to go back to that other water. The amount and rate that the water shrinks back varies from one surface to the other because it depends on how much each different surface attracts water. So, as Gooley states, there is a simple experiment we can do that proves two fundamental things. That water has a skin formed by surface tension, and that this tension is the result of the weak bonds between water molecules. So remember, water is attracted to itself. The skin on the surface is because water is being pulled downwards towards the other water, creating surface tension. So surface tension creates a skin that is strong enough to support a small metal weight and we are going to watch a needle float on water. The paper towel sinks into the water and the surface tension catches the needle. The blotting paper became saturated, sank to the bottom and left the needle floating. This proves that the surface tension of the water is strong enough to support a small piece of metal. And now we need to prove that it is the electric bond between the water molecules that creates the skin. So Gooley advises us to drop detergents in because they carry charges that nullify the electric attraction of the water. 
which will make the needle sink. An interesting fact while we wait for me to put the detergent in is that Gooley says that by observing insects, we will see the water skin experiment at large. On a sunny day, if our shadow is directly behind us as we reach the water, we'll see a lot more insects. Why don't they fall into the water when they're sitting on the surface tension? It's because of the surface tension is stronger than the effect of gravity of the small insects. Which is what Gooley says, although I think gravity is in question. As you can see here, I put in a little bit of detergent and I think you can start to see a little dip in the metal. And I put in more detergent and I think you can start to see a bit of it go under a little bit more. But the surface tension was pretty strong so it didn't fully want to sink. So finally it sank. There it is. So this same tension that leads to water sticking to itself is also responsible for something called capillary action. If we dip a paintbrush in water, we watch the water flowing upward, even though gravity tells us water shouldn't flow upward in this way. So as you watch capillary action, has two effects. Water is attracted to some surfaces like glass and paintbrush fibers. And it's also attracted to itself. So the water is attracted to itself and see how it just rises up the paintbrush. The second that I dip the bottom in, you can see that it goes straight all the way up the brush. The meniscus effect, the surface of the water is attracted to the material above it and is drawn upwards since it is a narrow opening this pulls the whole surface of the liquid upward. The water is sticking to itself. The water just below the surface also gets pulled along and follows it upward. Every plant depends upon capillary action to get the water from the ground to its highest leaves. Gooley throws in an extra fun fact that the reason cleaning wipes are so good at mopping up water is that they have been specially designed to maximize capillary action. So, all right, now that we have our experiments intact, right, Gooley says the next time we pass a small river, stream, or ditch that has muddy banks, we need to take a look at the mud of the bank. We need to notice how it appears wet, higher than the water is splashing, higher than any water appears to be able to reach. So the mud above, where the water is not actually reaching, is a mixture of particles and air gaps like a fine honeycomb of thin tubes. The water gets drawn up into these gaps by capillary action. So again, cohesion, adhesion, and surface tension. With the result that the mud becomes saturated above the level of water in the ditch or stream. So because the water has been rising up these tubes, these thin fibers or the roots or whatever, it's being attracted to them, then it's being attracted to itself in there and then it's rising up. So clean water rises higher than polluted water. That's a pretty cool fact from Gooley. The main one is that the size of the gaps between the particles. So water rises much higher in soils with fine round particles. Water rises much higher uh, in soil like silts than in coarse soils like sandy ones. At the extremes, water can rise very high in clay, but will hardly rise at all in gravel. Air pressure also affects the amount of water that rises up through the soil and is then held in suspension. When there is a sudden lowering of air pressure, as we get when storms are approaching, the soil is unable to hold on to as much of this capillary water, and it drains out very quickly into the local streams adding to the likelihood of flooding during the storm. So now we see Gooley get into it and he says, remember that capillary action I was telling you about before? Now that is causing, could cause a flood because why? The air pressure when it's low has an effect that 
capillary action trees and shrubs and all these things aren't able to hold on to the water the way it was because they hold on to the water through capillary action. They don't drink like we do, sucking air through a straw or something. The Their water is attracted to their roots, right? Add he, it adheres to it. Then water is attracted to water within those roots, and then it goes all the way up to the top of the branch so the tree can drink. So when atmospheric pressure, so this is equal to 14.6, nine pounds at sea level the atmosphere is the gaseous envelope right so all the different gases oxygen nitrogen other gases um all around us up in the air so when the pressure is high we get blue skies light blue skies and it flattens down the water when the water pressure is low the water level rises and then we're getting, that's when we get storms, clouds, rain, and the potential for flooding because lower pressure from the atmospheric gases, lower air pressure, is going to mean less capillary action, which means that the trees and everything are already letting out their water, which means the water is going into the rivers and the, the ponds and the oceans or whatever. And now all that extra water is being added to what will then fall with the rain. And that comes before the rain because we get the low pressure before the rain. So Guli says, imagine you're in a coastal area. Notice that the sea appears higher than you noticed it before, even at high tide. That might lead you to suspect that the air pressure has dropped quite a lot. In turn, you can predict not just bad weather approaching, which is likely, but also an increased risk of flooding as some of the water being held by capillary action above all those streams, ditches and rivers is about to be released before the first raindrop has even fallen. Once we know the things to look for and what else and what these influence, every patch of water we see is beautiful, fascinating and a clue to something else. So at various times, these skills have been called magic and more recently psychic. They are neither. They are the fruits of a little curiosity, awareness, and a willingness to join the dots. He calls this chapter a whirling vortex. So we got barometers, which measure the level of the ocean using mercury. Mercury creates a vortex around electromagnetic fields. And so we have electromagnetism, meaning the water is attracted to itself. It's attracted to other fibers. Guli says, we get used to the idea that an understanding of water is one area. An understanding of water in one area will help in another area. So we learned about capillary action. We learned about a meniscus, so the curvature. It's almost like a crescent moon or a half moon or some sort of lens like that, depending on if there's cohesion, adhesion, if the tube is wet before or dry, then it will change this convex right he's talking about vortexes something that happens with water right when it goes to rocks and other things this is connected to electromagnetism this is co connected to water being attracted to itself and other surfaces so we learn that there's surface tension we learn that that surface tension um is what allows insects to land supposedly um and i believe them right? I don't know necessarily believe that gravity is the force that would pull it under, but maybe the insects able to land because insects not being pulled down by the water itself, right? There's an attractive force pulling water down. What's the attractive force for the insect, right? It's able to def defy certain things because of other factors. Anyways, um, have to read more for that but just right now we know that there's surface tension we proved that it's electromagnetic because we used the dish soap which cut the electrical connection and then the metal dropped to the bottom we zoomed in on that so you could see and then we learned a couple of key things like if you're walking on the beach and you notice that 
the tide is a little bit higher than normal than it than it normally is you know you have low pressure if you have low pressure you know that there's a chance of bad weather and not just bad weather but there's a chance of um flooding as well because the capillary action the action of water being attracted to itself and going up into bushes and trees and shrubs and all that is now unable to do it when the air pressure is bad. I mean low. So high air pressure flattens out the water and it's about a foot lower when the skies are blue. So it's all good to know. And tune in to chapter two, which will be how to see the Pacific in a pond. So that should be an interesting chapter and we'll break that down. I'll see you then.